Hey everybody, this is Mr. U.S. History. Welcome back to a brand new video. In this video, I'm going to be going through part two of my three-part video where I rank every U.S. president. Part one went over all the bad presidents, the 15 worst. Part two, this part is going to go over the mid-presidents, and then part three is going to go over the great presidents. So, in 24th place, we have John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, just like his dad, as well as James Madison, his presidency was the least successful part of his life. The only real accomplishment he had as president was just infrastructure improvements, which basically every president has done. I mean, not every president, but most presidents, if they've had the opportunity to do so, they have done this. So this isn't really anything special for John Quincy Adams to do. And on the negative side, you had the tariff of abominations occur under his presidency, in which there were extremely high tariff rates that were placed on the South, on the South. Well, not just the South, but the entire country, but they disproportionately affected the South. And this ultimately led to more sectional conflict and played a role in the nullification crisis, which Andrew Jackson eventually had to deal with. So, in total, I'd say the presidency was probably the least eventful part of John Quincy Adams' life. And I'd argue his presidency is actually the most uneventful presidency in American history. All that really happened was extremely high tariff rates that led to a crisis after his presidency and just infrastructure improvements. Just not a, I, I can't even think of any like uh, long-term positive impacts of his presidency. And there was a negative impact, which was the tariff of abominations. So, yeah. In 23rd place, we have Andrew Jackson. This one is interesting. So I put Jackson one place above Adams. But keep in mind, his main legacy with regards to how he's been portrayed in the media and in historical books, at least recently, has been the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears. He used to be viewed very highly by historians until recently with, with stuff like race relations being brought more so into rankings of presidents of the United States. And the Indian Removal Act certainly led to this, which is many Native Americans were placed from their their home territories, their homelands, and they were displaced towards the Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. Now, this law was clearly meant to steal land from Native Americans and then use that land for white settlers, and this land was ultimately later used uh, for plantations and slave owners. But keep in mind, in Andrew Jackson's defense, I will argue that Native American removal and the ethnic genocide of them had occurred ever since Christopher Columbus first ended up in the New World. And I believe this law was inevitable regardless if Jackson was president or not. And ultimately, I would argue actually had Jackson not signed this law into bill, had he vetoed it, or had it not passed the House of Representatives, I believe white settlers would have eventually just gotten impatient. And they would have done what they had done in New England, and they just would have slaughtered every single Native American there was, considering how they outnumbered them, and they just wanted the land. So, yeah, one could make a case that that would have ended up happening had this law never been passed. I'm by no means arguing that this was a good law. This was a very bad law in terms of how it treated Native Americans. But just look at what the alternative could have been. And he also instituted the spoil system, which gave... Um, which gave positions in the federal government to, to based more so off of political loyalty rather than merit. And although Jackson's intentions here were to remove corruption in the government, this led to more corruption in the government. And Jackson also dismantled the Bank of the United States, which led to an economic recession that his successor had to deal with. And the people who were hurt by the bank were the most were his constituency, which were the poor farmers. So this was certainly a negative policy by Andrew Jackson. Though the reason why he's not ranked lower on this list is because he was able to pull off something which no president in American history has been able to do. He paid off the entire national debt. And also keep in mind, he stood up for the Union and wasn't going to let John C. Calhoun and South Carolina, the state, he wasn't going to let them nullify a new tariff that he had placed. And he just put them in line and he put Calhoun in his place. And this was really kind of what Lincoln did later, which was trying to preserve the Union. So I think those two accomplishments of Jackson certainly prevent him from being ranked lower on this list. So, yeah. In 22nd place, I have John Adams. John Adams, again, like John Quincy Adams and James Madison, his pre-presidency was fantastic, but the presidency itself, not so much. Uh, there was one huge uh, accomplishment of Adams with regards to foreign policy, which was 
the U.S. and France, there was growing conflicts with them over the U.S.'s lack of involvement in the French Revolutionary Wars. And France was not happy with that, considering how they had helped America during our revolution against the British. But Adams did the right thing here, and he prevented the further escalation with France into a war. And he did the opposite of what James Madison did. James Madison, he basically just went along with what his party wanted. He went along with what the hardliners in his party wanted. He went to war with England, despite the United States not being ready for war here. Adams recognized that the U.S. was not ready for war with France, and even though people in his party were pushing for a war with France, Adams went against that, and he ultimately led to peace with France. That was uh, ultimately led to Thomas Jefferson being able to pull off the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the U.S., and that was only possible if relations with France improved. And he did this despite many in his party, including Alexander Hamilton, wanting to go to war with France and wanting to escalate conflicts. So Adams did the right thing here. Though I would argue the one thing that prevents Adams from being ranked higher on this list is his signing of the Alien and Sedition Acts. This was an unconstitutional violation of free speech and freedom of the press. And America wasn't even in a war or a major conflict. Like, at least for Woodrow Wilson, the United States was involved in a war. Under John Adams, despite trying to de-escalate conflict with France, there wasn't any war that the U.S. was involved in. And there wasn't any massive insurrection or civil war, which Lincoln had to deal with later. Although, I will argue in Adams' defense, unlike Woodrow Wilson, Adams rarely enforced these laws. So, it didn't really have that much of an impact, but they were still unconstitutional violations of free speech. And Adams' biggest accomplishment, I would argue, isn't just making peace with France, but also after he lost re-election to Thomas Jefferson... He was able to step down and allow for the peaceful transition of power, which I think was a huge step in the right direction, and led to future presidents who lost re-election, ultimately allowing for the peaceful transfer of power. Although one could argue that that didn't happen recently, but I'm not going to really get into that. So, 21st place, we have Chester Arthur. So Chester Arthur played a huge role in civil service reform. He signed the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act into law, and this basically removed corruption from the federal government significantly by getting rid of the spoil system and replacing it with a meritocracy. This was a huge, this is a really good bill that was signed by Chester Arthur, despite Arthur himself being a product of the spoil system. So this was an act of political courage to go against the people who had actually enabled him, and Arthur actually went against the party line on tariffs and was willing to lower tariffs and did, did it because he thought it would uh, help the American people, rather than just sticking to the party line Republican issue at the time, which has raised tariffs. Though, the one thing that prevents Arthur from being higher on this list is the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prevented Chinese uh, immigrants from entering the United States and being able to stay there. The initial, the initial ban was 20 years. Arthur got it removed. Arthur vetoed the 20-year bill and got it down to 10 years. So, because of that, I do believe that Arthur didn't genuinely want Chinese inclusion, but I think he was ultimately forced to do so by Congress, but still, signing the Chinese Exclusion Act was not at all a good thing. So, that's what prevents Arthur from being higher up on this list. And again, this was very popular among the American public, but still, it doesn't excuse the fact that he signed the, law into, the bill into law. And uh, other than the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, which certainly, which got rid of a ton of corruption in the Fed. In 20th place, we have William McKinley. William McKinley led the economy to a recovery following the Panic of 1893, and he largely did this by raising tariff rates, which I'm not exactly a big fan of, but they did overall lead to economic growth, so I'm not really going to complain about that. Plus, his leadership during the Spanish-American War was very good, and we ended up gaining more colonies. This wasn't a pointless war like the War of 1812 was. We gained, colon we gained colonies and we gained territories, such as Puerto Rico and parts of the Caribbean, and we even gained the Philippines for a short period of time. Although, speaking of the Philippines, this is where I'd argue that this is what prevents him from being higher on the list, which was his policy in the Philippine-American Wars, where th it was pretty inhumane what they were doing in the Philippines. They were kind of putting people in concentration camps, sort of, and... His policy in the Philippine Islands could be considered tyrannical and a violation of human rights. So I'd say that um, McKinley's legacy is sort of mixed when it comes to this. He had a great domestic policy with regards to a strong economy, 
and he also was able to expand American tor territories, but at the same time, his policies in the Philippines were not great. Number 19, we have Gerald Ford. So Gerald Ford led the, pre led the country following Richard Nixon's resignation, and he inherited many of the problems from Nixon, such as the high stagflation rate. And Ford's response to that was something called WIN, which is known as Whip Inflation Now. It didn't result in a complete elimination of inflation rates, but it actually did lower inflation rates pretty significantly from what they were earlier. He largely did this by adopting more Austrian school economics, such as lowering taxes and lowering re uh, regulations. This is what Reagan would do eventually, and it did actually succeed and le led to uh, less inflation. However, he still wasn't able to win re-election just because the inflation rate was still high under his presidency. And his pardon of Nixon was controversial, although I wouldn't argue that that was really that bad. He also continued Nixon, Nixon's policy of detente with the Soviet Union. But at the end of the day, Ford didn't really have any strong long-term positive impacts on the country in his presidency. So I'd argue he's a very mid-president. Number 18, we have William Howard Taft. So, I feel bad for Taft. Like, his whole legacy now is just being that overweight president who wasn't, who wasn't able to get out of a bathtub. This story isn't even true in the first place, but it's still attributed to him. If you ask, um, if, if you ask somebody who even, like, has a, the faintest idea of who William Howard Taft is and you ask what, what's he known for, they'll say the whole bathtub thing. So, yeah, this didn't even happen in the first place. And also, his presidency ended earlier than it should have because Theodore Roosevelt prioritized his ego over the interests of the American public by running against Taft and launching a third-party bid that was just completely unnecessary and led to the election of Woodrow Wilson as president. And his whole rationale for doing this was because Taft decided to be his own man. And even though Taft was criticized for being insufficiently progressive, Keep in mind that he actually busted more trusts in his presidency than Roosevelt did in his presidency. Plus, the Payne Aldrich tariff, which has been criticized by many progressives during the time for not lowering tariff rates enough, did actually lower tariff rates, just not as deeply as they wanted to. And the deep tariff rate tariff cuts that they wanted wouldn't have happened, uh, which wouldn't have realistically happened, considering how there were many conservatives in the Senate and members of the old guard who wouldn't have wanted tariff rates to go down. So this was a compromise that lowered tariffs the most possibly that it could have. So th this is not at all Taft's fault in the slightest. However, I would argue even though his domestic policy was good, his foreign policy not so much. He employed something known as dollar diplomacy, which while not as bad as Wilson's foreign policy, still led to worsening relations in Latin America and played a role in the Latin American con continent being unstable during Wilson's first term. So that's certainly a negative for Taft. So he had a good domestic policy and a bad foreign policy. So that's what puts him near the middle for me. Number 17, Warren Harding. This one is going to be controversial for sure. Many historians have been trashing on Harding ever since the 1940s. They call, Some have even called him the worst president in American history. I don't agree with this in the slightest. I think many people who think Harding is the worst president in American history, they look more so as uh, Harding as a person. They think that he wasn't um, he wasn't fit for the presidency. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't have any vision or any policy or any, all of that. Well, if you're going by that logic, then one could make an argument that James Buchanan was the best president in American history. I mean, think about it. He was very qualified for the job. He had very extensive credentials before his presidency, and Ultimately, he had a, he was very experienced at the end of the day, and he and people at, during the 1850s would probably argue that he knew what he was doing. So yeah, I, and basically anybody who's president doesn't know what they're doing. Like it's a very hard job. And then of course there's the corruption under Harding's presidency with the Teapot Dome scandal, in which there was huge corruption in his presidency. There's no denying that. But unlike Grant's presidency, where the corruption led to public perception of Reconstruction being damaged, and then ultimately the withdrawal of troops from the South, and then the whole the segregation and Jim Crow following all of that, as well as an economic recession following the Grant corruption, Harding's corruption didn't really have that bad of an impact on the American public. It didn't lead to a long-term negative impact like Grant's corruption did in his administration. And Harding also wasn't personally involved with the corruption, just like Grant. So 
Yeah. I wouldn't really... The corruption is bad, no doubt about it, but I wouldn't say it's as bad as the Grant administration corruption was. Also, keep in mind, he signed the Emergency Quota Act, which I do think is probably the worst part of his presidency, if we're looking at it, like, objectively. The Emergency Quota Act greatly reduced immigration and only allowed immigrants from Western Europe into the United States and placed immense quotas that I think were very harmful. But other than that, his presidency was actually largely a success that people don't really look at too much. Like, for example, he inherited an economic depression from Woodrow Wilson. He was able to lead the economy to a recovery following that depression. Plus, he also undid the Espionage and Sedition Act, and he freed Eugene Debs from prison, despite Eugene Debs probably agreeing with Harding on absolutely nothing regarding the issues. And he also undid many of Wilson's damaging policies with regards to race relations. He hired some black appointees in the federal government, which I guess isn't that great, but at the same time, it's a pretty big improvement from Woodrow Wilson, who just completely segregated the federal government. And he also, in fact, addressed a racially segregated uh, crowd in Alabama and told them that racial segregation and discrimination is wrong. So I do believe that Harding didn't have any of the racial biases, or I think he was completely devoid of racial prejudices, unlike his predecessor. Plus, his foreign policy was a huge improvement over Wilson, and the U.S. relations with Latin American countries did improve under Harding's presidency. So... I don't think Harding's as bad as bad of a president as people say he was. He actually did lead to a return to normalcy following Wilson's presidency. Also, keep in mind, he's actually he was actually very popular during his presidency, and he was very beloved by the American public. It's only after his death and the whole uh, corruption coming to light that he became viewed as negatively as he is today. Plus, uh, I'm not gonna I'm not I'm by no means um, a revisionist when it looks at history, but. It is very clear that people who have been ranking the presidents of the United States do have a strong bias towards more active and, like, more, I'll just say, liberal presidents. Like, that is pretty clear when it comes towards historical ratings of presidents of the United States. And Harding does contrast with this view, considering how he lowered taxes on the wealthy, and he was very conservative with regards to economics. But at the end of the day, this did work, and the economy did recover following the depression of 1920. So, I think Harding is a better president than most people think he was. 16th place, Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes is mostly known for the way in which he got into office in what was known as the Compromise of 1877, in which Hayes would be allowed to serve as president and the federal troops from the South would be withdrawn. But keep in mind, federal troops from the South would have been withdrawn even if Tilden won the election. And Tilden was actually more so in favor of doing this than Hayes was. Hayes did it much more reluctantly. It didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. So I wouldn't pin this on Hayes. And then, keep in mind, Southern states were actually considering seceding from the Union if Hayes was, if Hayes was inaugurated as president and federal troops from the South weren't withdrawn. So, yeah, you can see right here with Tilden or Blood. So I'm not really going to hold this against Hayes that much. He also paved the way for civil service reform that ultimately Arthur would get would get the ball rolling on with the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act. He ultimately paved the way for this and started this whole process by cleansing the federal government of corruption and making it more so based off of merit than political appointees. Many of the hardliners in his party were enraged with him over this, but he still did it nonetheless. He also willingly limited his power following one term. And the economy actually recovered from a recession under his presidency. The recession that happened under Grant's presidency, the economy did recover. But at the end of the day, Hayes didn't really have any long-term positive impact on the country. And he's just a very kind of like, he was a president who was good in the short term, but no long-term impact, which is why I think he's a slightly above average president for me. And his Native American policy was also not that great. There were He continued many of the Native wars that Grant had started, and just not that great on Native American policy, but keep in mind, there was no president who was great on Native American policy before Calvin Coolidge. So Grant is just overall a very meh president. Uh, I mean, Hayes is overall just a very meh president. I think he's just slightly above average for me. Number 15, we have Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge, I believe, is the first president in American history to have an actually good Native American policy. 
He signed the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924, which gave citizenship to Native Americans. This was a massive step in the right direction. Plus, the economy was booming under his presidency. He was able to cut spending, cut taxes, and keep a balanced budget, and the economy was just soaring under his presidency. His fiscal conservatism was paying off. And there are some historians who argue he was responsible for the Great Depression. I don't believe that. I don't how I don't even know how he would be responsible for the Great Depression. So yeah, Coolidge's economic policies had nothing to do with the Great Depression. And I'd also argue he he just like Harding, he did a good job with regards to civil rights and made sure that African Americans would be able to have civil rights and he was opposed to racial segregation and racial seg and racial discrimination and he believed that all men are created equal period his foreign policy was also really good and you had the kellogg briand pact under his presidency where all the countries that signed it would make a pact to avoid war and promote peace this, this didn't work obviously because of world war ii ultimately happening and as you can see here Three signatories of this, Germany, Italy, and, Fran and uh, Japan, played a role in World War II starting, and they were the three Axis powers. But it was still a noble effort nonetheless. Although I would argue one big negative of Coolidge that prevents him from being higher on this list is, of course, his signing of the Immigration Act of 1924, which heavily restricted immigration from Japan. Coolidge knew this law wasn't great, wasn't right, but he still signed it nonetheless. He also vetoed many benefits for veterans and farmers who were struggling and also prevented federal aid from going towards uh, many of these cities and places which were damaged by hurricanes and natural disasters as well as floods. So those are a few negatives of Coolidge there. Plus, he also was president under a very easy time when the economy was doing well and he basically didn't have to do anything for the economy to just thrive. In many ways, I'd argue if James Buchanan was president under this time period, Buchanan would have been viewed just as greatly as Coolidge is. So, yeah, he was given a very easy time period. So that's what prevents him from being higher on this list. He's like that quarterback who has, like, all the perfect weapons around him and doesn't really need to do anything. Number 14, we have John Tyler. John Tyler is mostly remembered for the fact that he actually was served in the Confederate Congress following his presidency during the Civil War. And I think that's a key reason why historians have ranked him very low, as well as the fact that much of his domestic agenda was just him arguing with Henry Clay and the Whigs over a national bank, and he just was against all of the Whig policies. But his foreign policy was a massive success, though. He was able to open up China to trade with the United States and also improved, relationship, improved relations with the British following uh, pretty much... 12 years of declining relations with the British, and also he ended the Seminole Wars with the Seminole tribes in Florida, so his foreign policy was overall a success. Plus, he paved the way for Texas annexation into the, into the United States. So as a whole, um, nothing happened with regards to domestic policy, but he had a good foreign policy. So yeah, I think John Tyler is an above average president. Number 13, we have James Monroe. James Monroe is, of course, remembered for the Monroe Doctrine, which was meant to prevent further colonization from European powers into the New World. This was a great policy by Monroe, and it had a huge long-term impact on, on the world in a positive way. Plus, the annexation of Florida into the United States happened under his presidency, although on the negative side, there was a huge economic recession under his presidency. Not a huge one, but there was an economic recession in the 1820s, and this recession is actually ultimately what led Jackson to come to think that the Bank of the United States needed to be dismantled. And the Missouri Compromise also happened under his presidency, which was just an effort to kick the can down the road. But I'd say the Monroe Doctrine is overall the biggest net positive of his presidency, and had much more of a long-term positive impact than any of the negatives I just said earlier. Plus, he, he was president during the era of good feelings, where there was just no um, partisan strife or no feud at all. It was a very peaceful time in American history. In 12th place, we have George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush ha did great leadership during the Persian Gulf War. He This was probably the last good foreign war that the United States had gotten into. This was the last one that was actually a success. And we were able to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And 
Bush was actually wise enough to not invade Iraq, something which his son wouldn't exactly do. But yeah, he, he didn't invade Iraq, and this was the right thing to do with regards to uh, foreign policy in the Middle East. Plus, the fall of the Soviet Union happened under his presidency, and he was able to handle the this very well. He was able to navigate the post-Cold War era quite effectively. He also signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is a main reason why many Americans who have handicaps today are able to live better than they would before this law was passed. Also, even though Bush is largely remembered for the economic recession under his presidency, this wasn't actually a recession. It was just a brief period of economic downturn, and it wasn't quite what we would call a recession. And in many ways, the perception of it being a recession is what led to Bush losing re-election. And another um, controversial aspect of his presidency was his decision, decision to raise taxes. He reneged on a promise that he made in, in the convention in 1988 where he said, read my lips, no new taxes. Although I would actually argue that this was a good policy on George H.W. Bush, this led to the balanced budgets that later presidents such as Bill Clinton got credit for. And ultimately, this was, a, this was an example of going against the party and being willing to be more independent and looking at things in terms of how they benefit the American people rather than your own political party. And he and Bill Clinton got all the credit for what George H. W. Bush did. He got all the credit for the balanced budgets that Bush uh, paved the way for. And keep in mind also, basically George H. W. Bush did all the dirty work while Bill Clinton got all the credit. That's the way how I see Bush and Clinton as presidents. In 11th place, we have Harry Truman. Harry Truman took over after FDR died, and this was a very vital um, time in American history. He had to lead America during World War II, and he did a very good job at this. He dropped the atomic bomb on Japan, which actually saved more Japanese lives than it killed, considering how a more prolonged war with Japan in the Pacific would have killed much more Japanese people, considering how the whole idea of Japan was it would be better to die fighting for your army than surrender dishonorably. So... This actually um, may, may have saved more Japanese lives, and it led to a quick end to World War II. He also recognized Israel as a country, despite many people in his inner, cir in his inner circle saying that he shouldn't, because of prevailing anti-Semitic attitudes during the time. The Marshall Plan was also enacted under his presidency, where funds were given towards Eastern European nations that were struggling following the, following the war. His handling of Joseph Stalin and the communist threat in Eastern Europe was also very effective, and his whole policy of containment was overall a good idea, considering how the Soviet Union shouldn't have even existed in the first place, considering how authoritarian and bad that regime was in general. He also desegregated the United States military, which was a huge step in the right direction towards, right, towards positive race relations in this country. And, of course, the main negative of his presidency is, of course, going to be the Korean War, which he wasn't, which wasn't that effective. We weren't successful in getting rid of, the Nor of North Korea and making, South Co and making the entire Korean uh, subcontinent much more pro-anti-communist. Uh, and this war was just ultimately a stalemate that never saw an end, and this was ultimately accomplished later on during Eisenhower's presidency. But, yeah, overall, Truman's handling of the Korean War is the main reason why he isn't higher up on this list. So anyways guys, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to like this video down below and subscribe to the channel. And tune in for part 3 which is going to be coming later.